<laughs> okay, my name is Kate Hunter, and Brian, this is Brian and I. This is our store, and we are so excited to have Josh here tonight. I'm gonna say the welcome. So I just wanted to welcome y'all. We've seen some new faces, some old faces. Hi, CT. <laughs> you made it. Josh is a special person in our life for so many reasons, one of which he teaches our daughter, Nora. So he wears so many hats, and I'm excited to see him tonight talking about his writing. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for fighting the brutal 70-degree rain. <laughs> so tough. Tough week we all had. But thank you. It's uh. It's a nice week, and uh, we've all been looking forward to tonight for a while since Josh handed us the book in the uh, playground at school a couple weeks ago. It's been uh, exciting to anticipate and to celebrate this. Joshua Berman is a travel writer and columnist for the Denver Post. He's the author of guidebooks for Avalon Travel Publishing, Moon Nicaragua, Moon Belize, Living Abroad in Nicaragua, Maya 2012, and in spring 2016, Moon Colorado Camping will be out, which I believe Josh and his family spent last summer researching and taking notes around Colorado. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, National Geographic Traveler, Yoga Journal, and Crocodile Love is his first narrative travel book. In 2005, Joshua Berman and his bride, Sute, canceled their wedding reception, diverted the money to a plane ticket fund, and applied to volunteer positions around the world. Crocodile Love recounts the mishaps, quests, and encounters of their extended round-the-world volunteerism honeymoon. Praise for Crocodile Love comes from Ryan Van Duzer. Crocodile Love has enough action to rival Indiana Jones, yet plenty of sweet moments that will melt anyone's heart. Berman redefines what a honeymoon should be. I know Joshua as my daughter's teacher, teaching her Spanish so she can speak at home with her mama, Kate, who's fluent in Spanish. I know Josh is a return Peace Corps volunteer, a thing we share, as I was lucky to serve in Thailand, as a fellow dad of three girls who somehow wrote a book. And lastly, in October, Joshua and I shared a very special moment across the street at our old location. Joshua was the translator for Ernesto Cardinal from Nicaragua as he gave a poetry reading and as he gave comments before and in between the poems, there was Joshua to the left of Ernesto Cardinal, just celebrating his journey in Nicaragua, his love of Spanish, his love of poetry, and just love of the community. And that will always be special, Joshua. I finished the book last night. I now know Joshua as a fantastic travel writer, sharing insightful vignettes of familial and cultural bridges, celebrating the ritual of honeymoon as a possibility for further growth in a relationship and for the journey of years ahead. Can we please give Joshua a nice warm and his free welcome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kate. Um, thank you, Innisfree, for having, having me here and for hosting this and for letting me and my friends come tonight to celebrate the launch of Crocodile Love Travel Tales from Extended Honeymoon. How you doing? <laughs> This was, uh, it's about 10 years of, of work in the making, plus two years of marrying, or meeting, marrying, and traveling. Uh, the original goal was to come back to Boulder and get this done before our first child was born, and then before the second child was born, and the third, and uh, we got babysitter tonight, and it's, it's done now. We got three babysitters tonight. That's the joy of working uh, at a K through 12 school. Um, so we've got, they've got man up defense. <clears throat> so thank you for coming. Uh, I am the author of five other books. They're all guidebooks. Uh, the next one, Colorado Camping, is coming out this spring. But tonight, we're not here to talk about lists of campgrounds or accommodations or restaurants or bus schedules. Those are all kind of the nuts and bolts, the, uh, the skeletal mechanics of of travel. 
tonight we are here to talk about the heart of travel. Uh, for 15, 20 years, I've been I have been writing mostly of this this service travel world, these guidebooks. And as I did that, of course, I had all these experiences and was writing stories and was publishing little stories here and there. But um, I knew that because of the trip that that Sute and I took, um, that I did want to do a, a narrative book. So this is the first time. A lot of my colleagues who write guidebooks, it, it is kind of a dream to jump from that shelf in the bookstore of that big wall of guidebooks and jump over to that little weird travel literature, travel essay, uh, narrative travel shelf where um, it's kind of a mishmash. It's hard, it's hard to know where to place that. And, and they're all unique stories, as is this one. So if you know my blog, uh, the Tranquilo Traveler, which I started before this trip, so I, I guess that makes it one of the first ever travel blogs in the world. You know that I like to inject purpose into travel. I think that when you put a meaning or a mission into your trip, it adds a layer to your trip that, that really enriches it. And if you can add multiple missions or multiple reasons for your trip, then you get multiple layers. And that's what happened um, as we planned our trip. So this is um, one of these quotes begins the book, uh, the one about the honeymoon. And then we have Mark Twain, there ain't no surer way to find out whether you like people or hate them than to travel with them. So it's, it's a risky endeavor to, to go on a long trip with someone who may be your soulmate, <clears throat> but it also, it's a huge reward. Um, I do want to acknowledge, did Tim, Tim Bryson make it tonight? I don't think so. Tim is my book designer. I'm going to talk a little bit more later about the dream team, uh, the dream editorial team that I was able to put together, but Tim Bryson is a local book designer, did this cover and did the whole interior, and he stuck with me for a number of years doing this. So when we got married, uh, it all happened pretty quickly. This is one of the wedding cards that we received. We met and married and decided instead of you know, a big reception to put money toward plane tickets. And I'm gonna read the first little section here. I've never done this before because if I did, I would be reading hotel descriptions. <laughs> so this is a nice change. So we thought that by having a quiet, off-grid wedding ceremony, we would avoid the cheesy, unwanted pitches from cruise ship companies, all-inclusive resorts, and the wedding industrial complex in general. They found us anyway, shortly after we registered our names and newlywed status at the courthouse in Baltimore, and proceeded to bombard us with dress catalogs, bridal magazines, diamond brochures, and of course, travel agents and honeymoon specialists. Honeymoons Inc. knows that honeymoon planning should be exciting and fun. You're embarking on a journey that you'll remember the rest of your lives. Enjoy the ride, the whole ride. Complimentary couples massages, off-property excursions, golf and scuba included. Our consultants have planned over 7,000 honeymoons. Click to see why you should choose us. But we didn't want to go somewhere that had been visited by 7,000 other couples. We wanted the trip that had never been attempted, something new and extraordinary for each of us and for both of us. We wanted to go to hot, intense places together, to cities where open markets breathed that sweaty, fish-gutty, trash-burning smell that clings to travelers' memories forever. We had each whiffed it before, this odor of deep travel, but it was something else to embark as husband and wife to seek it out together. We would pressure cook our fragile new marriage, take it around the world, introduce it to new friends, and make it bubble and boil into everything we could be. So that's what we did. And this trip we planned, as I said, I ended up having so many juicy layers to it that I knew it would be a book one day. Um, I'd like to, before we go to Pakistan, just uh, point out this. So we, I've got this map here of our route. Um, and I'd like to thank my, my new friend, um, Scott Lucier, is of Passport Maps. He helped, helped me design the maps that went into the book and also this. And what they do, Passport Maps, is they, you get back from a trip and you give them your itinerary and they create your route maps to frame and put on your wall um, with your pictures up there. It's a really, really neat service for travelers. So this is our trip. Um, it was 16 months, 16 countries. We did originally purchase a 
round the world package ticket, one of those things that you link together and it, it planned like almost a year out. And we did that and we started that and we ended up canceling it halfway through. Um, we originally were supposed to go from Southeast Asia and then continue um, toward Bali and Australia and New Zealand and, and go around that way, but because mainly because of our volunteer assignments and also because for reasons I'll tell you later, we needed to, we had to get to Africa. Um, so we kind of we stopped, we rerouted, and ended up coming all the way back through here. And tonight we're going to kind of travel this loop together a little bit. I'm going to read a couple of scenes from here, just from um, Tim Bryson, everybody, the book designer, the man with a plan. Um, we signed up to volunteer, and it ended up that ended up helping to route our trip, but. Why would we decide to begin our honeymoon in Pakistan? It was because, in 2005, <laughs> it was because my wife's great-grandfather, uh, Dr. Ralph Randall Stewart, was a botanist and an, an explorer and a educator, and he worked for 50 years of his life at the Gordon College of Rawal Pindi in Pakistan. And uh, so that's where we went. We, I, I, that was our first mission, was kind of looking into that. And I talked to Sute's family, who's here tonight, and got some stories from them, and some stories of, of, from her, from her great-grandpa growing up. And we went to Islamabad, um, and, we, and doors opened for us, uh, because we were looking for the legacy of this man, Dr. Stewart, and visited his college. Gordon College of Raul Pindi, and, and this is where we, we first made our, our first contacts, and it, it's one it, the first, you know, when you go with that mission, with that meaning, it gives the, it lets your trip start to take you a little bit, and that's what, that's what happened here. Um, this was at the National Herbarium. These are the, the plant, the samples that he collected and pressed and signed uh, almost 100 years ago, and there was about 50,000 of them, and they're, they're kept in the National Herbarium and we went and visited those samples as well. And then we were uh, sent north to Karimabad, and we, we took this, this plane there up into the Himalaya. Um, this was one of my dreams, so we kind of went and explored Sute's family, and then I got to go trekking in, in, um, in the Himalaya, which was amazing. This was our view from, our, or from a fort in Baltit in Karimabad that Dr. Stewart had visited once and wrote about seeing snow leopard cubs there that were the pets of the Mir of Hunza, the, the ruler of, um, of this territory in the northern areas of Pakistan. And one night in that area, we hiked up above town and we found this, this weird tea shack in the middle of a poppy field that rented us a tent for about $2 a night. And we climbed up and, and saw the sunrise on Mount Rakaposhi that night. And then got to go on this trek where we hired the porter's names were Mohammed and Mohammed, and our guide was Karim, and Mansoor was our cook, and this was about a one-week trek over a few glaciers. Uh, this was camping at about 15,000 feet. There's the two glaciers merging into each other below. Sute with the crew. There's Sute getting a, a ride from Karim on one of the, the creek crossings. And then we stayed our last night in the shepherd's camp and uh, had to buy a ram for bakshish and, and eat the liver uh, in order to stay there. <laughs> I ate the liver, Sute stayed in the tent. I went over with the guides and we, we chowed it down. It was fried with, with uh, salt, it was good. And those are the people at the shepherd's camp. And then we made it back down the mountain, back through Islamabad, and made it to Lahore. <clears throat> and that's the next little section I'd like to read. Now, our, we were on our way to India. We had to make it to our assignment. And anyway, this happened. We found the entrance. This is chapter 9. It's called Sufi Night. We found the entrance to the Regal Internet Inn. You can see the sign <laughs> right above the door. A hostel just off the Regal Chowk between a lopsided tea cart and a man squatting and sipping a tiny cup. Feel at ease, said the tiny sign amidst a jumble of wires above the door. 
I paid our driver, then we squeezed with our packs up three narrow flights of stairs to a cluttered office where a young man at the desk greeted us with a salam. How many nights, he asked, as he handed me a padlock and key. Just one, I said. I was sure of this. The worst heat wave in a century was smothering Lahore with temperatures well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The polluted air stung our eyes as we rode across town to the hotel. No, we had no intention of exploring. We were too fixed on getting to India to give Lahore its due. Yet there we were in one of the great cities of the East, the heart of Pakistan, Garden of the Mughals, the Prince of the Punjab, founded 4,000 years ago by Lav, son of Rama, Lahore was now about to be dismissed by two clueless American tourists as an annoying stopover. <laughs> In that exhausted moment of arrival, we just didn't care. After several days of unsettling travel from Hunza and Islamabad, we were just happy to stop, even for just a night. Inside the inn, a small international youth hostel, shirtless, hungry-looking travelers buzzed in all directions, scuttling through twisted hallways and shared spaces, clinking around the outdoor kitchens, cups of tea, open backpacks, laundry drying. The social activity was heartening, but the condition of our room was not. It was barely bigger than the sagging, clappered bed touching three of the four cardboard walls. There was one lazy ceiling fan and no other furniture. We put our things down and went back outside. On the rooftop, a ladder led to a 10-foot square, broken brick, fly-ridden lounge area where a few sheets of tin provided some shade as a weak breeze blew through. The few fellow guests sitting there welcomed us with smiles and indications of where to sit. I leaned against the crumbling wall. For the first time in days, I was able to relax. The filthy plastic mat covering the concrete felt like a deep couch cushion as I dropped into it and Sute did the same. This is called the tribal area, said a smiling 19-year-old. He reached out his hand. I am Ciro from Venezuela. Why is it called the tribal area, I asked. Because there are no laws here, he said. Ciro grinned and squatted barefoot in a small mountain of cigarette butts, matches, rolling papers, and dust. We began the familiar backpacker ritual, the sizing up. How long have you been traveling? Where are you from? Where have you been? Where are you headed? Suti and I went, were on an extended honeymoon, we told him. We'd arrived that day by bus. We were on our way to a volunteer assignment north of Calcutta, India. Our site was clear across the subcontinent in West Bengal, and we had one month to report for duty. Ciro nodded his approval. He was westbound after six months in India. He was traversing Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey. I will take the Orient Express when I get to Turkey, he said. He would eventually return to Paris, where he was going to school. His excitement was unbridled. This was Ciro's first big trip, and he was floating on the freedom of it, happy to be introducing us to the scene, inducting us into the tribe, sitting on a rooftop in Lahore, standing suddenly to watch a flock of pigeons fly against the setting sun. The bricks behind my back were still warm, but the cooler temperature brought on by the evening was lifting everyone's moods. There was more talking, laughter. I sat and scrawled in a soggy notebook as more strangers arrived, each face popping up the ladder with a smile. Monica was a solo Australian who just shaved her head. She sat next to Sute. Then a lanky Latino appeared and Ciro introduced him as El Boliviano. El Boliviano came to Lahore to learn the harmonium, said Ciro. El Boliviano smiled and sat. He'd been staying at the Regal Internet Inn for three months, he said. He was studying Kawali, a type of music used by Sufi Muslims to meditate and induce a nearness to God. I reveled in the growing camaraderie in our respective missions. Some hotels isolate their guests, keeping them apart. Others bring strangers together by virtue of the common space. The tribal area accomplished the latter magnificently. This week, Sufi night is on the full moon, Ciro said, rocking back and forth. Gonga and Mitu will be drumming dole. They are brothers, said El Boliviano. He took a CD from his worn leather man satchel. The cover was a blurred shot of the musicians spinning in circles as they drummed. What is Sufi night, I asked. Every Thursday night, El Boliviano began. For the last 500 years in Lahore, there is a tribute at the tomb of Baba Shal Jamal, a Sufi saint. I read the CD case in my hand. It said the rhythms of dole are used to catalyze the mind of the devotee as he is seeking a spiritual trance. 
Recognizing and accepting new travel suggestions is not always easy or obvious, especially when you think you already have a plan. But on this evening, things could not have been clearer or more enticing. Full moon, spiritual trance, Sufi night. My traveler's radar bristled with the possibilities. Malik arranges everything, Ciro said, still talking about Sufi night. He is the hotel owner, Malik Karamat Shams. I looked at my wife a few feet away across the circle, sunglasses and scarf clamped on top of her head, nodding as Monica spoke to her. She looked up from her new friend and met my eyes across the tribal area. Thursday was three days away. We had planned to be in the mountains of India by then, in Dharamsala, out of this horrid heat. Suti and I have always shared a rare synchronicity, finishing each other's sentences, predicting each other's desires. Traveling, traveling gave us a whole new realm in which to connect in this way. That's how, in that instant, without speaking a word, I knew we would stay more than one night. <laughs> so we did, and uh, there's a few more chapters er, on what happened when we signed up with Malik. He took us to some uh, pretty extraordinary places. He was a guide who did these trips, these cultural trips, for free, because he, he was a retired journalist who opened this, this hostel in order to meet people, uh, to meet interesting people, which I'm sure he did loads of. And he would take us just for the cost, and he would round us up, these, you know, these dirty groups of foreigners, and just take us. And he kind of tried to push the boundaries of where tourists were, were tolerated. And um, so it was a little edgy, um, but amazing. So we crossed into India, and we had to uh, make it all the way across, as I said, to our, our assignment in Calcutta. Um, and when we got to Calcutta, we staged, basically, and uh, that's where the organization was based, but our site was still going to be uh, farther to the north. Our host organization in Calcutta, this is uh, chapter 13, City of Joy. Our host organization in Calcutta had made reservations for us at the VIP hotel in the northeastern outskirts of the city, near the airport on the desolate Kai Kali Moor. It had been chosen for its proximity to Jana Sangati Kendra headquarters, which was still several bus rides away. It was a bizarre setting to begin the second phase of our honeymoon, volunteering for three months among tea workers in West Bengal. We settled into our room at the VIP just as the monsoon got underway. It was damp and warm, but somehow homey. And it was temporary, one of many stepping stones to get to our assignment site and to begin our task. We'd set the ball rolling several months earlier, before we departed the US, when I asked Sute one morning, what about volunteering? What better way to approach a region as new and enormous and complex as India or Southeast Asia than by working with a host organization already established and trusted in the community? Volunteering would increase the chances for unplanned encounters and shared adversity, both surefire relationship strengtheners or killers. We were aware of the risks. Also, during our extended travels, volunteering would give us the excuse to take a break from the constant movement, for short periods anyway, so we could experience a country as more than mere clients, customers, fairs, and marks. It would give us a chance to learn customs and a few bits of language and to make friends with people that we would never have otherwise met. We had looked at our options for short-term volunteer opportunities, then submitted an applications to American Jewish World Service, AJWS, a nonprofit international development organization based in New York City with ties to grassroots organizations around the world. In the AJWS Volunteer Corps, our professional skills, those of a nurse and a writer, would be matched with the, prof with the specific project needs of a host organization somewhere. They searched for a proper placement among the many organizations in their network and eventually decided to place us with Jana Sangati Kendra, the People's Solidarity Center, a human rights organization based just north of Calcutta. Calcutta, the one-time capital of the British Raj, officially Kolkata or Cal by hipsters who lived there, was at one time known as the Paris of the East for its trade in herbs, teas, and spices. Calcutta is an uber city sprawled along the Hooghly River, which flows downstream to the tiger-inhabited Sundarban swamps in the Bay of Bengal. It is a medley of styles, cultures, cuisines, languages, and politics, and it has produced India's greatest literary giants, classical poets, and revolutionaries. Chief among those, is Rabindranath Tagore, who wrote, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. I had also read that 
In the last 50 years, so many rural families had inundated Calcutta. It had grown to be more famous for its decline into mass urbanism and slums than its short reign as a colonial jewel. Yet our hotel was removed from the wonders and problems of this great city. We were so close yet so far, we looked out our room window at an empty urban landscape and swollen gray clouds. If we hadn't already, Suta and I had now officially veered off any semblance of a tourist trail. No more backpacker hangouts, international internet cafes, or banana pancakes for breakfast. And this was just the beginning, a week-long orientation in the relative luxuries of the VIP hotel before heading to our work site farther north. We still had to travel 15 hours by train to get to India's tea belt. We wouldn't have any fellow foreigners with whom to swap stories there, but we would have an apartment, a car, a driver, translators, and a task to perform. The Janasangati Kendra office occupied, occupies a cramped, converted home in a residential area in the northern outskirts of Calcutta. Anuradha Talwar, the director, greeted us at the door. She had a commanding presence, a strong voice, long black hair, and a flowing sari as she led us inside. The office had low ceilings, cluttered desks, ancient computers, file cabinets, and shoeless workers buzzing between rooms. Anticipation buzzed between my wife and me as Anuradha picked up a piece of paper to read a description of our assignment. We sipped our tea and listened as the next chapter of our trip was revealed to us. So uh, you can see Calcutta's down to the south and then Birpara, it's in this, this weird section of India. We are right near the Bhutan border um, in this area where tea was first planted 150 years ago. Um, and, and tea was, it was a big theme of the whole trip. In India, everywhere was tea. Everywhere you turned, you would, you would drink uh, mostly this kind of powdered black tea that was served with a lot of milk and sugar. Or if you're riding the trains, they would give it to you in these ceramic cups, and when you're finished, you'd smash them on the tracks. Although when we were there, it was just starting to convert to white plastic cups so that all the train stations, you, it, was, it was a mix of ceramic, but also just a lot of white plastic out there. But the tea walla would come anytime, and they were just everywhere. Um, and these were the fields and the workers that we worked with. I'm going to read one short scene from chapter 14 called Tea is Meant to be Bitter. The smells of fresh fermenting chlorophyll was thick in the air as we followed the manager past the leaf sorting machines. Churning industrial age gears and presses made an enormous ruckus and trucks drove around dumping and loading tea leaves at all various stages of production from seed to final product. Suddenly, the plantation manager stopped in his tracks and stared at the honey vanilla chamomile label dangling from the rim of Sute's plastic travel mug. That is not tea, he said to her. She had brought a stash of Colorado-based celestial seasonings in a Ziploc in her backpack, and we hadn't expected any trouble. <laughs> Pakistan and India are the world's top producers and consumers of tea, both creating and feeding a global thirst for it. During our trip, charcoal-heated pots of tea appeared constantly and out of nowhere. Once in the narrow lanes of the Birpara market, my laundry walla bought me a five-rupee shot of chai to drink while he folded my clothes. Most Indians we met drank powdered black tea spiced with cloves and drowned in ultra-sweetened hot milk. Tea sellers ladled it from cream-crusted cauldrons into throwaway ceramic cups that you smashed on the train tracks when you were finished. These were being replaced with white plastic cups which carpeted the ground around each station. Each of the thousand cups of tea we drank was as different as the person who served it and the vessel in which it came, but they all had one thing in common as the garden manager was so insistent on reminding us Real tea contains the crushed, dried, and fermented leaves of the Camellia sinensis tree. That was tea, not herbs, tea. <laughs> the activity and sheer volume of leaves here was impressive, especially after visiting a closed garden that morning. They called the plantation gardens. Uh, one of the plantations that had shut down, that had been a place of quiet, hot despair, where thousands of workers and their families were without income, health services, and reliable food and water. At this garden, things were active, buzzing, alive. Still, as we continued our tour, knobby knees, the manager kept berating my wife. Chamomile is not tea, he yelled above the machines. Mint is not tea. Only tea is tea, and it is not served in bags. Have you ever looked at what inside a bag? He asked, not waiting for an answer. Tear open a tea bag and look at what you're drinking. He walked us to the roasting rooms with their toasty odors and clouds of fine tea dust that made us sneeze. Sute continued nodding politely, maintaining a placid smile for the man. But when then I saw her begin to bristle and I hoped he didn't push it. 
Uh, so we we stayed there. I could go on. I'm not going to. We're going to make our way along the route. We stayed there for three months. We lived in this village. We got to live uh, with our two translators and our housemates, Sharmishta and Dabashish, who became you know kind of our best friends. They were from Calcutta, so this was kind of foreign territory to them too. But they were really experienced labor organizers, and they were already had connections in this community and were already trusted. And the great thing about this project was short-term projects, short-term volunteer projects, are, they're very, you have to be very careful. You can do more damage than good on some of this, with some of these programs. But when it's this well established, I felt like we, we there's such a good training component to this assignment. We, we did a report, we did a survey of 120 different families on six different gardens to um, show malnutrition levels and, and to kind of prove that some of this malnutrition is, is leading to deaths in the area. So there was an end result. There was this report that got sent to Geneva and helped extend um, the work of, of our translators there. So uh, we felt pretty good about that. And, but we would go out to these plantations every day and go into people's homes. Um, and on the closed gardens, it was, it, was, it was pretty bad. And it was frustrating that our job was pretty much just to document and, and not do much else. Uh, this was, so this was Sute and Sharmishta. Um, we, would, we would measure the children and weigh them and then take uh, uh, reports on, on any malnutrition or deaths that they had had in the family and when their garden closed. One of the only alternatives that these workers had when the tea gardens closed was crossing the border in Bhutan and crushing rocks by hand. And these are the, des the descendants, the tribal Adivashi descendants of the first workers that the British rounded up uh, 150 years ago and said, you're going to pick our tea. And then they kept them so that they and their children and children's children stayed in the same job. Um, so this was our life in, our, in Birpara. We had this apartment. We ate on the floor. Uh, Debashish cooked. We ate either egg curry and rice or kitchery three times a day for three months. Um, we had our squat toilet. We had, I think we named our pet spider Shelob. I think she was around for a few weeks. <laughs> Um, and then we did some travel in Indian trains. Uh, I think this was one 12-hour ride that Sutea and I had to share that berth, uh, that narrow <laughs> little bed there. And we saw a couple of uh, traditional sites along the way. But then we rerouted. Uh, we actually did spend some time in, in um, and this is in Bangkok, and we spent I think three or four months actually in Southeast Asia and for a chunk of that we planted ourselves and I wrote a book called Living Abroad in Nicaragua um, with my co-author Randy Wood who was living in Africa at the time and we <laughs> did a survey of several hundred expats in Nicaragua. I was in the Peace Corps in Nicaragua and spent a lot of time there and Randy and I wrote the first guidebooks uh, to tourism in the country. Uh, but writing that book and getting that advance and then getting our next assignments that enabled us to say, okay, well, we're not going home yet. And we, the trip kept extending and extending uh, for great reasons, we think. And this is somewhere in Laos, I think. And then we went to, we did another assignment, a two month assignment in Sri Lanka, and then accepted a third assignment in Ghana. And this was the house that we were put up in, in Ghana. And again, we were given kind of an adopted family that we lived with. And we worked at Planned Parenthood Association of Ghana. And one of the reasons that we agreed to this assignment, even though it was, it was almost a year and a half in, I was starting to get ready to go home. Um, but Sute <coughs> had done two public health assignments already, the last two with the tea workers. And she really wanted to be in a clinical position in this put her in the clinic with the doctors and the nurses, um, in, which is in the city, in the, in the capital of Accra. And, they, and I've worked with, um, uh, with the youth group there and with their PR guy, Anang, who coincidentally had an older brother who lives in Boulder whose name is Ni Arma, who some of you might have uh, been to his drumming sessions. But I worked with Ni Arma's younger brother in Ghana. We, uh, we started a blog. We reported some stories with these guys. And we had a chance to go to the north to, vi to deliver something to a clinic way in the north of Ghana. So, and we met with this man, Chief, and there's a couple of chapters about him. He's the chief, the tribal chieftain of a certain village, um, but he was also a chief medical assistant 
um, with medical training and ran this clinic. And we stayed in an old Peace Corps volunteer's home there for a few days and visited the clinic and visited with the chief of that village. And, but this guy here, David Kansukulari, uh, an incredible man, I gotta get a book out to him, uh, who told us his life story as we spent, as we spent time with him. Um, we also learned during that time, we saw actually the effects of uh, President Bush's global gag rule, which cut off funding to Planned Parenthood Association of Ghana, even though they had nothing to do with abortion. Um, they cut off funding and we saw clinics where, where uh, programs had, had just been canceled and the effects of that. Uh, so that was pretty eye-opening. And this was at the clinic, the dispensary. They had this really neat clinic uh, built in the, in the shape of kind of a, a traditional family compound, a West African compound. Um, this was just visiting the school. And they made Sute. This was the, the nurse that we worked with, and she and Sute got to work kind of assessing um, a pregnant woman when they would come in, and then they uh, convinced her to put little baby Ipti on her back, and, and that they got a kick out of that. And then they said, we got to go to the market. So they made her take... Uh, the picture for this event was Sute going to the market with a baby on her back, and then and then I, uh, Sister Ayi basically messing with everyone. They're like they 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 couldn't figure it out. She said, "Yeah, that's her baby." <laughs> <clears throat> so we're going to end in the Ga in the Gambia, um, which, as far as I'm concerned, really was the climax of the trip. I mean, there were a lot of high points, obviously, but after 16 months. We returned to Sute's Peace Corps village where he, she had served eight years before. We had done the Peace Corps separately and, uh, and then met through, through common friends a couple years later. And so part of this trip you know, was getting our, our own experience together. Uh, after, I finish, uh, after we finish our trip here, we're gonna hang out, I'm gonna take some questions and then I'm gonna sell you some books and sit at the table and, and sign books and hang out with anyone um, who wants to hang out, and then we'll get some beverages later. I think there, there's another event here, some music here, right at 8.30. So, <clears throat> as I said before, it was very important to, to go to Africa. We didn't originally think that we would be able to do it. Uh, Sute had already visited my Peace Corps site. She came down to Nicaragua with me um, shortly after we met, and I proposed to her there at a waterfall, and she got to see the village where I lived for two years. And it's so important because, you know, I mean, for the rest of our lives, half of our stories are this one time in Nicaragua, this one time in the Gambia. So to be able to picture it and to put um, images to it is really important. We didn't think we'd be able to do it. Africa is very uh, expensive and, and somewhat difficult to travel in, but because of the volunteer assignments, it put us in striking range. And with not that much time left, now we did have plane tickets. We had to make it back. We had limited time and we went to the Gambia, which was probably also the most difficult place to travel of the entire trip. Um, we landed in Banjul, this is the capital of the Gambia, is this, this really interesting country. It's like a snake that pierces into Senegal, it's all Senegal around it, and then it just follows the Gambia River all the way up. Um, our job, we landed in Banjul, we had to fight uh, for permission to be in the country because they told us our passports were too full. Um, <laughs> we're like, what? And there's th that scene is in here. And we went to the Peace Corps office and we got them to kind of help us and give us a letter. And in exchange, we agreed to, to lead a, a training session at um, Tendaba Camp right here. So we had a few really hectic days trying to get our, our visas cleared and permission. And then um, I'm gonna read you a story about driving uh, from here, actually in the car park from here, we had to take a, a car up to Tendaba, spend the night, uh, give a little Peace Corps training the next day, take questions from the new trainees, and then take another car to here, cross the river to Farafini, and, uh, and then make it down to Sarakunda, this tiny little village um, where Sute had been, and had, she had no contact with there. I'm, I'm on Facebook with my buddies in Nicaragua every day. I, I still travel there every year. Um, this was a very, very different experience. And then after, our, we had to make it back on the north. There's two roads in the country, the South Bank Road and the North Bank Road. And after we had to make it back on the North Bank Road, make the ferry, make it here, 
visit the sacred fertility granting crocodiles that the book is named after and then make it home and start a family. So, <clears throat> chapter 31, last car to Soma. Let's see what the next one is. Okay, yeah, great. <clears throat> Dust, flies, and plastic danced across the lot, scudding the orange, hard-packed earth between rows of brightly painted buses. The vehicles were decorated with crudely drawn eyes above headlights, hand-painted prayers, faded flags, torn stickers, and Nike swooshes. A few buses were about to leave, piled high with teetering loads of luggage and livestock, goats bleeding, exhausts spewing, departure imminent. I hoped for one of these. Two seats left, we jump in and off we go. Soma motole? asked Sute. Where's the Soma car? The driver shook their heads and pointed farther into the lot. I watched their loaded vehicles drive away, then I looked up at the pounding, descending sun. The Gambia's sole bus company had gone bankrupt years before, replaced by a loose, unorganized mob of independent Mercedes trucks with Bisumila in the name of God and other religious declarations painted across their hoods and windshields. The roads were so poor now, only so many vehicles existed in the country that were sturdy enough to make the trip. In Thailand, we had ridden tuk-tuks. In Ghana, they were called trotros. In the Gambia, the main transports were gilly-gillies. They were all variations of the bush taxi or chicken bus, and a small fleet of them was parked at Brikama. We had just to locate the right one, and off we went. Don't get to Brikama after midday, we'd been warned at the Peace Corps office during our briefing on how to get to Tendaba camp. We'd been held up by bureaucracy in the capital and arrived late, and now had little choice except to find a ride. I followed my wife across the packed dirt, trying to keep up as she guided me through a surreal landscape of rotten fruit, vendors, biting ants, feces, beaten dogs, and diesel-stained puddles. In addition to our backpacks, we carried cheap woven bags brimming with fabric, fruit, and other gifts. Hospitality is offered freely in the Gambia, but guests are required to bring silifondo. We would be especially responsible for bringing gifts since our hosts, two days up country, did not know we were coming. Assalamu alaikum, Sute said as we emerged from the alley of red, yellow, and green cars. Alaikum salam, responded the man sitting there. He wore an ankle length purple dentico and mirrored sunglasses. The man had a bare, bald head. He sprawled on a bench next to an empty vehicle. He and Sute gently touched right hands in greeting, then brought their hands to their chests. Watching Sute don her African skin as we moved through the continent was a high point that I'll never forget. Long, unspoken words, grunts, expressions, and body language flowed from her mouth, hands, eyes, and poise. I'm not sure who was more surprised. Sute, she rediscovered behavior from her past. The Gambians, who were not used to two-bob foreigners knowing their language, or me seeing this whole new part of my wife come alive. Bright, tie-dyed cloth draped Sute's shoulders and curves. A matching Tico squeezed her head, protecting her long hair from the dust. In the Gambia, Sute's body remained tense the entire time we were there, which was unusual for her. Her neck stiffened and extended, a periscope peering up and around, watching out for the both of us. I loved this woman so protective of me and proud. Kaira Bey, she said, peace be upon you. Kaira Darong, the man responded, peace only. Soma Motole, Sute asked. It just left, the man said in English, but I am going to Soma. You will go in my car. It is the last car of the day. A vast charcoal cloud slipped in front of the sun. My name is Mohammed, he said. We took a closer look at his vehicle. It was a big, boxy Uber van covered with bright paint stickers and posters. One window sported a Rolling Stones tongue and the smiling, waving portrait of Le Frere Momar al Qaddafi. Near the center of the windshield was a six inch American flag, stripes faded into whiteness so that only the blue field behind the stars and the letters USA remained. The flag was next to a black and white sticker bearing Osama bin Laden's face. I have pictures to prove it. In the middle of the windshield, in the most prominent position, there was a poster of President Yahya taped to the glass. Even though it blocked half the driver's field of view, Yahya's waving presence would, I presumed, ease our way through checkpoints in trouble. Where are you from? said Mohammed. America, I said. America, fine, fine. Where are you going? Tendaba camp, said Sute. Fine, fine, said Mohammed. You are welcome. We will leave soon? Inshallah. Of course. The definition of inshallah, a common term in the Gambia, ranges from the literal if God wills it to, as Paul Theroux observed, the imminently more realistic translation, not bloody likely. <laughs> Three passengers were standing next to Mohammed's car, talking idly in a slow motion, it seemed, and fending off flies and hawkers. We joined them. We would leave when there were enough passengers. 
The sun dipped lower. The sky grew grayer. <laughs> we claimed seats, then waited outside the Gilly Gilly as vendors of random goods approached us, mostly barefoot children, wide eyes shaded by baskets of wares on their heads. None passed the opportunity to stand and stare at the pink, sweating foreigners. The children looked at us mostly in silence. They couldn't tell if we were potential clients or animals in a zoo, so instead of offering us their fruit, cigarettes, plastic toys, and roasted corn, they just stared. Muhammad called a boy, called to a boy selling stickers from a battered cardboard box. I watched through waves of heat as he poured over images of famous imams, stopping to give me a short lesson about each bearded face. This man is from Senegal. He is a very holy man. He is 93 years old and has 80 wives. There were also Western cartoon characters and country flags from all over, but Mohammed stopped at an oversized laminate of Madonna. Not the Holy Mother, but the singer, circa her kiss-blowing like a virgin days. He used a rag to wipe the dust from his car's back window and stuck her on. Her sultry, lip-glossed face joined Bin Laden, Gaddafi, and Jagger. <laughs> Mohammed looked to us for approval, and we shot him a couple of thumbs up. The afternoon wore on, and the sky continued to darken with clouds. A faint smell of rain appeared. We would be traveling at night, an eventuality I tried to avoid on the already dangerous roads in countries like this. But we had nowhere to stay in Brikama, couldn't return to Banjul, and less than a week to make it upcountry to Sarakunda, deliver our gifts, and return to our flight to Casablanca and home. Mohammed didn't care about our tight schedule. Finally, a group of eight chatty women showed up who appeared to know him, and he finally gave the order to load up. Even though Sute and I had staked out our seats hours before, it was a mad melee. I pushed through elbows, knees, and luggage, forcing myself into the tiny space between my wife and a burly matron with two children in her arms. The roof rocked with luggage being transferred to it, and the crying of goats was followed by a trickle of urine outside our wind windowless window. <laughs> Mohammed climbed into the driver's seat. It was time to go. We were off and started lumbering out of the parking lot and out of town. But first, he had to buy gifts. When we arrive in Soma, he explained, turning around to talk to us, the first thing they will ask is, where are our mangoes? Silifando le, Sute said, giving just the right rise to the last syllable. It was Mendinka for, where's my gift? She was using the phrase Mohammed's family would use when they greeted him that night, and he laughed at her accuracy. You know, how do you know Silifando le? He asked. <laughs> Sute told him the story of how she had lived for two and a half years in a village called Sarakunda, near Farafini on the north bank. Sute nodded. Tomorrow we'll take the ferry at Soma, she said. At a roadside stand, the multitude of brightly clad women piled out of our car and haggled while Mohammed smoked the cigarette next to, our window, next to our window and explained that these were his brothers, wives, and children. I am bringing them home to Soma, he said. The women shouted and clamored with the mango sellers until each had come to some agreement and the fruit was gathered into bags and baskets. They piled back in the car, swaddling infants, bags of mangoes, quiet toddlers, and we departed Brikama at exactly the hour I'd hoped to be arriving in Tendaba, still a five-hour drive away. At least we are moving. No to coup, yes to democracy, read a hand-scrawled sign on the side of the road. President Yahya smiled and waved from our windshield. We asked Mohammed if the government was planning to fix the road. The North Bank Road, they are fixing, he said. The Taiwanese, they are fixing it. But the government wants the same company for the South Bank Road. So we are waiting. How long have you been waiting? Eight years. <laughs> what has changed in that time, I asked. Yahya's fatter, he said, grinning. Uh, so, and then following that is we, we stride unannounced into, into her village. And there's actually a video of that um, on my site that you can see in a, in a chapter devoted to it. Um, so I would like to uh, leave some time for questions. And I'd also like to just acknowledge again my dream team um, who put this book together. Of course, there's uh, Tim who did the, all the design and, and the covers, and I told him how patient you were over, what, five years or so. Um, and Jody Berman of Berman Editorial, no relation, but she's a local editor and, and couldn't be here tonight, and did a, a big chunk of the editing. And Ann Irwin um, also helped with a lot of the final editing. Uh, I'd also like to thank about 120 of my Kickstarter backers. About two years ago, I raised some money to pay some of these editors um, and to put this together. So thank you, thank you to all of you, um, uh, especially my parents, Beth and Steve Berman, who are here tonight. I want to honor them. Uh, none of this would be possible, of course, without them for so many reasons, both specifically supporting this project and this book, and, um, and it's my mom's birthday today. Yay. I hope you have something. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Beth. Happy birthday to you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my mother-in-law, Louise, who, uh, through the many thousands of hours of work that you know that this took over the years, who, who helped uh, watch the kids so many times and. Um, and also supported in, in the, the story by, by telling me parts of the story. Um, so it's, it's, it has been a great journey and it's, it's amazing to be here um, with this book in hand. So with that, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, you, we can pick up a book here, I'm hanging out, and you can um, purchase it for $20 at the cash register. Um, but any questions? Sir. Yeah, so Josh, first, thank you so much. Um, since some, uh, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Since time had elapsed from the honeymoon to the <clears throat> publication, were there some tricks of memory you had to play, like going to photos, going to journals, checking in with Sutin? Like, how did you pull it all together? What were some of the pieces? The question was, how did I pull it all together? Um, to put this together. Well, it, it was kind of more like a chiseling job because I came back with hundreds of thousands of words worth of blog entries and the stories were all kind of in there. So it was, it was trying to identify where those stories were. Um, and I also had a stack of Moleskine journals about this tall um, and some watercolor map paintings. Finish this out. Let me see. I forget what else is here. Okay, it's more of the Gambia. And then, yeah, this, this are the crocodiles. Uh, they, they, the crocodiles grant power and fertility, and they, they worked. Um, I told you we had the three girls when we came back. That's the first one in the oven there. Um, so I had all that material, and, and yeah, it was basically, for me, mostly an editing job, and then when it, trying out different ways to organize the stories. It ended up, ended up being 36 stories, and the book's divided into four parts, um, Pakistan, India, Ghana, and the Gambia. Um, I also am going to be speaking, there's a, um, at Chautauqua on February 28th, there's a travel writing conference all day long, and I'm, I'm going to be teaching a session on, on honing uh, the craft of, of writing a travel essay. Um, so there's going to be a number of speakers there, actually, very, very good ones. Um, and I think also that with the passage of time, even though it was frustrating that it took that long, you know, when the project goes on the back burner for almost two years, when you take it up, it's only going to be, um, you're only going to have a new perspective and a fresh angle at it. And I think that ended up helping a lot in, in where we were in our lives. And, and writing the Denver Post column for the last four years, it's 500 words a month, was a really good exercise at really how do you um, craft you know, the chapter. I wanted most of these chapters to be able to stand alone as travel stories, but also trying to, to have the one story of, of the book. So that was kind of the biggest challenge. Jason. Um, such a remarkable idea, and you pulled it off, which is also just amazing. Um, I was just curious, like, what was the moment when you had decided we're going to do this? And like, what was the essential point? Like, you didn't need to do this. <coughs> question is, how do, we, how do we go from really deciding, like, we're, we are going to do this? Um, yeah, I mean, when those tickets arrived, we, and this was so long ago, we actually had paper airplane tickets, and I shot film, um, a film camera on the trip, but it, it was pretty quick. We decided everything pretty quickly. Um, you know, it, we did take hours of, of lying down and looking at atlases and throwing place names around, like playing cards and cutting places out. And I mean, it, it, it's pretty fun. There's um, uh, a book called The Way of the Traveler um, that describes four distinct phases of any trip. And planning, dreaming the trip and hearing the call to journey and then planning it is the second phase. Uh, and for some people, that first phase might be years and years and years of, of dreaming the perfect trip. For us, we kind of dreamt it, planned it, and then it's taking the trip and then it's telling the story is the fourth 
phase of any trip, and all four phases are equally important. Uh, Joseph Dispenza is the, is the author of The Way of the Traveler, and I always, I always like that. Yes? What were you doing in Ghana specifically, you? So I worked with the PR person, and, we, and we, he and I worked on, we reported a couple of stories around town that they could, you know, of, of the effectiveness of their program, just to help them get the word out about what Planned Parenthood Association of Ghana was doing. Um, so we, you know, and that, I was actually going around on foot and, and talking to people and, and, you know, writing up. Um, interviews and, and stuff. And that was the other thing, I think, with Brian's question. I did take note, uh, I tried to keep dialogue um, down as I went, both for the storytelling purposes and then also to, to help Anang. And then did some work with their, with their youth group as well. Uh, the truth is I was a little burnt out by then and I wasn't totally into that assignment, even though it had a lot of potential to be really good. Um, but I was starting to feel done um, whereas in the Sute was completely jazzed by her job and, and, uh, and worked with a, a really fun group of nurses and doctors there. Um, but yeah, in Accra, is, it, was, it was kind of a difficult city, but we were there during the World Cup, and that's another theme that comes out. Um, when, not only were we there during the World Cup, but the first year that Ghana, that any African team advanced as far as Ghana did, and they beat the U.S. during that time while we were there. And I was with the youth group, and I have another video of that when they score a goal and they threw flags over me and told me don't cry and <laughs> everyone goes out on the street and plays drums with that at every single goal um, and that was the entire time we were there and then we were up at, at in chief's compound up in the north and he called for the tv to be brought out he he summoned the local peace corps volunteer he sent someone else to get us beers and he sat up on kind of this throne and we all sat around outside under the stars watching. This was after Ghana had been eliminated, but we watched the team, uh, Brazil, that beat them. We watched them get beat that night, so everybody was happy. <laughs> <clears throat> yes? Did you ever feel like any of the country's like, language was a barrier? I mean, yeah, I was so never... used to, I traveled in Central America for years and flew in Spanish, and I had kind of lost that. Uh, that piece of traveling and feeling completely overwhelmed and lost and clutching the guidebook um, because, yeah, I mean, in Pakistan and India, and, all, and well, I mean, in some of the places there was plenty of English, but in some of them there was not. And, uh, and yeah, you have to, it, it, it's good for me as a language teacher to feel that because um, I, I take it for granted that people just hear the Spanish and they understand it, but we, we felt quite lost. Um, and then, yes, and, there was sometimes during our health survey where we, we had translators translating, usually from Bengali to English, but there was times we had, had another translator to go from the Adivashi to Bengali to English. Um, and they made it work. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Uh, stick around, hang out, and enjoy Innisfree in their new space. Congratulations, Innisfree. Uh, wonderful new place here.